I'm going to uh, cast what you learned in a new light. You have learned rubber elasticity in your uh, so-called uh, polymer physics one. Yeah? Let me remind you, uh, rubber elasticity, I assume the way you learned it is you stretch this piece of sample. All of a sudden, we're talking about extension. Remember, so far, we have talked about simple shear. And this is called, in particular, if I just do it this way, it's called uniaxial extension. So I'm going to stretch these two uh, uh, ends, for example, with certain speed, or, for example, with certain force, which means certain stress. And the length will change from initial this much to a different amount of L now. So what you learned is you call L over L0 as lambda, and you learned that the stress is related to the lambda uh, that you imposed as such. Do you recall this formula? It must have, you must have had it. And I'm going to cast this in a new language. And the reason we have to do it is we have to borrow this part of the molecular origin of this so that we can use it uh, in the future discussion on the why part, which is next chapter. So formally, without, uh, you know, without getting yourself bored, uh, let's first uh, acknowledge that if you have a chain, you're trying to stretch it or you're trying to maintain the chain at this level, you find there is a certain amount of force you need to apply. That's how you learn rubber elasticity, right? And you find the amount of force you apply is actually related to uh, the separation. And moreover, you find that this uh, uh, hooking constant is actually kT uh, divided by um, uh, the average length of, of this uh, separation. This is what you learned. And you further learned that uh, by changing the, by, uh, by considering the entropy change and by looking at the, the free energy, uh, Helmholtz free energy, you, you assume the internal energy doesn't change. You compute for what uh, entropy changes according to Boltzmann principle. And that's how you end up having this expression where G is kT times the number of uh, uh, strands. So strands in the sense that each of this, each of this is a strand. So I'm just recalling for you how, how we had rubber elasticity, right? Uh, I again assume you guys consider the, the extension case. Uh, rarely in textbooks one talk about shear. Did you learn shear for rubber? I think not, because it's not uh, not the uh, 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 not uh, standard, not frequent. So because of that, I offered you a result for shear in the book that you can go through if you are interested. Okay. Now, um, so so it, this is all under this section. I I did it very very quickly. So in detail, uh, the section first was about uh, of confirmation entropy, which uh, a concept I'm just repeating in the in the book, and and the elastic force. 
That's what we just went through here. And then section two is, uh, uh, is about that free energy, which is this, which contains the issue of shear. So you can consider uh, in the case of shear, how you end up coming up with a result that, look re that looks very familiar to you, the hooking law that I told you. Same G. G is known as, uh, we reserve it as so-called shear modulus. Whereas this is also shear modulus. But quickly you can think about it, how it uh, uh, goes back to a so-called uh, uh, tensor modulus. In other words, consider the limit where lambda is small, meaning only barely above one. In other words, you only stretch a tiny bit. Okay? Okay? You just stretch a tiny bit. Then a, a piece of mathematics known as uh, Taylor expansion. I'm not going to fancy you with this. So Taylor expansion. Uh, you find out in the limit when epsilon is very small, this is nothing but three epsilon. Let's do a Taylor expansion, so-called. Uh, it's okay if you don't you're not familiar with. Uh, what it essentially says is this. If you have this squared when epsilon is small, let's say epsilon is uh, only 0.055%, then this is very much close to saying it is just epsilon times two. Sorry, one plus two epsilon. That's Taylor expansion. Because the exact result is this but this term will be tiny. So that's the spirit of Taylor expansion. So in that limit, you'll find, if I reduce it, in that limit of, uh, of epsilon being very small, this becomes 3G epsilon. And there is always a more lovely way to write it. You write it as E epsilon. So E is 3G, and E can be known as the tensor modulus, or if you like, extensional modulus. So, of course, this is all in the limit of uh, incompressibility. Uh, th there's no, uh, 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 no volume change in that limit. Okay, this is only in that limit. And for rubber, we are, it's very uh, reasonable to assume that, or to, uh, to make the approximation that this is true. Okay. So with that, uh, I familiarized with you, for you, the, the content of rub elasticity. Now I'm going to show you how there is a more insightful way or more useful way to think about your rubber elasticity that you didn't previously learn and think about. Same thing, okay? What happens is this looks still pretty abstract. It doesn't give me enough insight. So let me proceed. So this is in so-called section 3.3. Okay. I see Jahal's uh, camera is off. Uh, and also, shouldn't there be another guy there? Somebody's not uh, here. We typically have four, four or five uh, people there. So let, let me make a note who is not there. All right, so.
All right. So uh, let's do this exercise. Very, very useful. Uh, as, as it will serve you very well in the future. So I call it the alternative. Alternative expression for this Rabi-Lasticity story. And let's recall the following that, uh, that I just mentioned, a force between the strand at distance r. So let me just strictly follow the notation. If this strand between the, this is so-called, I, I hope you're familiar with, we call it the end-to-end -end distance, right? This is all what you had uh, last time. Uh, I mean, in physics, polymer physics one. If that's the case, I repeat that my force. Well, I'm just following the notation. I, I, I see uh, no particular reason why I choose that notation. But, but let me use it. I call this force F star. And F star, according to what I just revealed for you, is this which is something, uh, if you recall, motivated previously um, through the idea that you can assign a chain certain uh, entropy, and that entropy is related to the probability of, of, of finding a Gaussian chain. So you find that to be uh, uh, basically related to R squared because a Gaussian chain goes as one R squared, 3 over 2, R squared, that kind of thing. And then, then you differentiate your en energy, you get this force. So that's how he did it. Um, um, there's another quantity I have to introduce. There's another quantity I have to introduce, which is, uh, uh, or a concept we have to introduce, which is you have this network in your crosslink system, right? So this is all the strands. I didn't draw them uniformly, but actually uh, I did it intentionally. In reality, the strand lengths are not uniform. It's a Gaussian distribution, actually. Okay, a Gaussian distribution. But for theoretical treatment, we just treat them as the same. Just simplify it. So keep in mind, we're doing uh, the same lens. So what happens is you can ask the following question. What you can ask is, um, I think I didn't uh, really motivate you uh, uh, here. We can probably do that in the future. Uh, I don't have to do it here. We'll do it in the future. But let's accept that result. It turns out, okay, the way you see it, the red are cross-linking. You can imagine all the red, there is a chain vertically coming out. Huh? Right? Because it's like a cubic uh, lattice kind of. So imagine all the red are the spots where another chain comes out of the screen. Yeah? Reasonable. Then you can ask, what is the aerial density of uh, strains? Well, usually they are load-bearing, so they are, I can call them load-bearing strains. But basically, what are the strains coming out per unit, per unit area? You, I will later show, not now. You will be uh, uh, convinced eventually that this area density I used uh, uh, the symbol is uh, is uh, involves some magic. It's one over p r. It has the right dimension. Okay, it is one over the area. You know, it's one over the area. So I got the r there. I'm flipping because I'm flipping to see where I introduced P. 
I introduced P. Hmm. Of course, as I try to be rigorous with uh, to, to follow the book so that the book can help you uh, when you read it. But P is yet to be introduced. Uh, it's a one of the most most important quantity in polymer science. Many textbooks, uh, many of them are written out of date. They never discuss what is P. So we'll be discussing it in the next, uh, uh, you know, in chapter two. But P has uh, uh, not only is one of the most important ones. There are two quantities besides molecular weight in uniquely important quantity for polymers. There are two quantities describing the length, uh, molecular length. You have heard cone lengths, yeah? Uh, in fact, when we discuss this uh, P, we will talk about it again, cone length. In our symbol, we'll call it L capital K. Okay. And there is a second lens, which is P. So important, chemists must know it as well, so deeply know it. It's called packing lens. P, little P. I think in my book, it's actually an italic P. You know, it laid, you know, it tilted. I uh, can later convince you the density that you're talking about is given by this formula. Okay? Now, a few things to think about now. Uh, Uh, there is a, a quantity called G that we just talked about. And uh, uh, if you still remember, the G involved, I actually last slide said something about it. It involves KT and the number of strands per unit volume. Uh, I, I, this is barely, I'm just begging you to recall. This is something you went through it before. G is involved with KT times how many of strands per unit volume in there. If I sa assign the physical volume of each strand, Uh, as uh, uh, a little v x x just remind us we are dealing with a cross link system it's the strands between cross links then by definition physical volume in other words you take this chain you smash them into the density of water how much volume it occupies right so it's a pretty strange concept but you can imagine it's not a pervaded volume you got a Gaussian chain. There are two volumes. One is the physical volume. One is the pervaded volume. These two quantities, take notes of it because we will eventually come back to it again. Pervaded volume of a chain, Gaussian chain is what? Well, to be rigorous, you can treat this as a uh, sphere. It's 4 pi over 3 R cubed. And if you are careful, you can even call that Rg. Uh, which stands for radius of duration, right? So there are two quantities. You have probably heard both quantities for the first time. We call this pervaded volume. It's not coil, but it's open, right? 
not space filling. But imagine you condense it until it's space filling. Then that's the physical world. The actuality, meaning actually how much space it occupies. Okay, that is denoted as one, as a, 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 a as a, a Vx. Then I can say, I can rewrite the expression. This is exactly just that. Because in each volume of Vx, I will find one string. Okay, I'll find one strand, right? So uh, the rest has to do with something foundational. Uh, and this is how P was introduced. So in fact, I am going to uh, I am going to. Uh, when I say jump, I mean, at least I should give you the formula. So it turns out this physical volume, it's a remarkable discovery. Uh, when I say discovery, anyone could have discovered it, but we obviously come too late. We learn from how people talked about it. This physical volume should be chain length dependent. In other words, if I have a chain, that involves, uh, in, in my notation, involves n x uh, cone lens. Then my n to n distance will be exactly square root of n x and cone lens. So I'm just repeating what you are familiar with for a Gaussian chain. So this physical volume should be proportional to the chain length, of course. When you double the chain, the volume it actually occupies doubles. Sure. So this volume should be proportional to chain length. Since R square is chain length, so this volume should be proportional to R squared. Get it? But on the left, you have volume. On the right, so far, I only have length. So what do I do? Something has to be there, right? Another length has to be there. That length is P. So this is in, uh, 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 I jumped the gun, this is in chapter two, but by necessity we are touching down that point. In the book I can always say, oh, go later, find it. In the class I can just show you how it is. So having said that, you realize G is actually KT P R X squared, yeah? Yeah? Big, oh, I said too fast because it is KT one over the volume. I'm just, I'm just substituting the volume expression back here. The rest is magic, right? I say it's magic. I mean it. It's rewriting it, right? I split the two R's, one to there, the other one to there. Downstairs, what is this? That, right? The force. It's a elemental. It is a a, a intensity unit. It's a it's a, a a a order magnitude description of that, what that force is. So it is that force. Okay, let me write it. Just follow the notation in the book. The notation will change later in, in, in subsequent discussions, but for now, for this chapter, uh, everything is totally uh, self-contained. And what is this quantity? 
I also introduced already. You remember? Yeah? What is that? The what? The aerial density. Did you say something else? <laughs> aerial density, yeah. It's an English word. Uh, it's aerial with a little L after a area to be an adjective, you know, to be additive. So it's area density. Yes, you remember it. And X just remind me it was a cross-link system because later we will treat this problem without cross-linking. So we just want to have a notation of it. All right. So... Um, This is actually, I claim to own this. I'm joking. My God, look at it again. G, abstractly we know as so-called modulus, pure modulus, okay? I all of a sudden split it, try to understand its origin. There are different ways to speak. In the past, before I wrote this book, I would just uh, do conventionally say G, the inside of G is, remember, it has the dimension of energy per volume. I went through that with you last time, a few lectures ago. So that's one insight you can do. Okay? I'm giving you a different insight. The more insight you have, the better. I'll give you a different insight that this G is composed of thinking about force per unit area. This is the force. This is a per area. Per area. Why is it dumb? Why, how, of course I know that. Why I know that? Because modulus has the unit of stress. Yeah? It has the dimension, the unit of stress. The stress, you learned it as a caveman for the first time, is force per unit area. So everything is back. But there is benefit to it. Let me give you the benefit. Just as I said, in my book, I showed you through the same argument you learned about rubber elasticity. In shear, you can derive this expression. Yeah. Now, here comes the rest. Plug the scene. Plug the scene. What do you see? So let me give that product a new name called retraction force, which is what it is. So I'm suggesting you think about your rub elasticity uh, in another way. You think it in terms of uh, the stress arises because each of the chain resists being deformed, which is the concept here, right? Each of the chain resists. How many chains do you have? Well, per unit area, you have this many chains. And that's how the rubber elasticity arises. It is not speaking about even entropy change, that, com that complex concept. I borrow that concept and get rid of that concept early on by claiming, oh, whatever that Boltzmann discussion of, 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 uh, of uh, um, entropy amounts to the fact that there is a force that arises in here. So here you can see this force, when, when all the, uh, the crossing is unstretched, 
goes to zero if you didn't deform it. So this is all on the baseline of anything additional when you start to do the shape change. Then there is molecular force that arises, and you can compute and think about that molecular force per chain force, as well as how many of these chains uh, in a given area. Because that goes back to uh, the concept that the stress is force per unit area. The force comes from individual chains. So actually, uh, this should be uh, something. I I'm just rewriting the ex this expression. There is nothing really uh, different. It's helpful for our future discussion. OK. Any questions on this uh, rather uh, fresh point about rub elasticity? Yeah. Right, 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 right. Indeed. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yes, yes, that's a good point, yes. So indeed, they are, uh, again, this is in the limit of so-called, uh, I don't want to use fancy word. A fancy word is both Poisson ratio is one half, which means the volume doesn't change. It's, this is only true in that limit. Okay, no volume change when you deform it. In that limit, yes, so Sophie is basically saying uh, the two experiments are, uh, are equivalent. You can do a, a little extension experiment. You can also figure out G, because they are just three, a factor of three related. And, and the, the, the rubber elasticity expression become a way for us to demonstrate this factor of three. Uh, but actually, it exists generically. Meaning, for any material satisfying this, it's going to be true. So it's only a geometrical, uh, because the two different modes are different. So they are just related internally in some way. Okay, so uh, any questions online? You know, there's always uh, uh, I should leave my phone uh, out. We don't have land uh, line anymore, so every phone, every. Uh, Call to the office is going to the to your phone now <laughs> uh, from the uh, uh, teams. Okay. <clears throat> That's it. Uh, the only thing I, I was, uh, oh, let me uh, give you one more tease. No, I mean tease, I, I mean I'm uh, trying to amuse you. Uh, there's only one thing that I switch my mind today, in, uh, just momentarily, decide not to follow the book uh, to describe this relationship. And uh, let me explain why I don't. So this comes out just so beautifully naturally, right? You can see it in front of you. If I do it following the book, which the book has a luxury, you write them down, the readers can read again and again, so there's always a chance to understand it. I want to avoid that. The reason is, if you do this for extension, there's, a, there's something remarkably confusing comes out. And that's why I avoid it. So for anyone who has the stomach, or who I, I invite certainly some of you to read the book, uh, to see how I had to uh, do it in a very convoluted way to handle that, to demonstrate the same point at the end of it. But I want to conceptualize the difficulty that has confused many of us, which is this. 
that um, oh, there's no escape of this because eventually we'll talk about this, uh, at least a little bit. At least I should expose you to this. That the fact you have, let, let's just say, remember those dots coming out of the screen, right? The, the density. I'm not drawing all the network now, so it's like this. Point being, suppose you have your sample like this. Oh, Lord. Right. And now I want you to think that there are dots coming out on both ends. Uh, there are dots coming out of your surface on both ends, like this, yeah? And now I'm going to stretch, yeah? So initially, I have an area that's this big. Let's call it A0. OK? Now I'm going to stretch. Oh, god, stretch uh, uniaxial extension. Uh, I suppose in rubber elasticity, you guys uh, spoke a little bit about it, because you guys are uh, worrying about how the uh, how the lens changes from initial L to L, initial L0 to L, right? Because the sample become longer. But probably you also knew at that time, because volume doesn't change, the cross-section is shrinking, yeah? In other words, this line, when I draw a lot, will become thinner and like this line, right? What does that mean for us, conceptually? It means that cross-sectional area, after a while, becomes smaller. But the number of dots I draw, I had nine of them. Don't I still have nine of them? Two more. Don't I still have nine of them? Can you answer me? Do I still have nine of them? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So if I now speak about density, aerial density of strength, then obviously I have changed if my initial area density is this. After lambda amount of stretching, what is the area density now? What is the error density now here? Lambda plus the, the, the initial density. Times, not plus. Uh, time, times, yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it changes. So that's how the discussion in the book has to acknowledge it, that this change. Secretly, Secretly, amazingly, in shear, the area doesn't change. The loading area does not change. That's why I, I choose the easier way to do it for you. The end of the story, the end of the discussion is the same. The, the, everything else we cover is gone. In other words. Uh, in other words, a, a good way in rubber elasticity discussion for stretching is we talk about engineering stress, which is the force divided by the original area. And in that case, you find this is true. And this is that. And it is different from the true stress by a factor of by a factor of lambda. 
Okay, we are done with the chapter one. Any questions? Yes. Wow, you started to invoke the concept of entanglement, which I have not talked about. <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> yes, so uh, short answer is yes, you, 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 it's, uh, uh, the strengths become condensed. Yeah. So we'll change everything. Yes. And this is the point which we will expand a little bit, become something. Uh, People have difficulty understanding. But in rubber elasticity, it's amusing that you say entanglement. In rubber elasticity, we had the simplicity of not so-called wiring entanglement in the sense we have them cross-linked. The chains are fixed because you have the cross-links. It's chemical cross-links, so they are permanent. It turns out that entanglement has the same effect as cross link temporarily. And the entanglement comes from the fact that chain, if you're like this, cannot cross. So for a while, they are stuck. And if you are examining your polymer on short enough time, they stuck very, very, uh, 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 as if it's cross-linked. Therefore, the same language, same treatment comes in. So for, yeah, so, so exactly this picture will also work for a non-crossing sample if we can uh, acknowledge that the chains remain entangled, so-called. And we'll come to that. We'll come to that much. Uh, but it's a significant point. So, uh, no, no, like, uh, let me clarify. None of this is anything of a discovery. It's a recognition that often neglected in the literature or in the textbook uh, when we discuss this. Nothing new, okay, so far. Uh, it's, uh, but it's still amazing that uh, standard information can be casted in a different way or can be uh, understood in, uh, in a more insightful way. Okay, so it's a, uh, it's a place to pause uh, because, uh, uh, so this section 1.3 on, on an alternative way to think about rubber elasticity uh, serves some purpose because it's bridging, uh, it's bridging us from uh, to, to chapter two in the following sense. Because prior to this 1.3, Whatever we spoke about need not to be concerned with polymer science. This thing can be anything that's being shared. See, that's the key point. And uh, the uh, Maxwell model, the way we discuss oscillator shear to learn about what you pointed up for, any material is, 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 uh, 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 is a candidate for you to discuss that. So it's only here we start to put in back a little bit of a polymer science. And, and whenever you find this, this is quite, whenever you speak about polymer science, I pray that you speak in molecular terms. In other words, have a language at chain level. Don't treat this as a black box, as we have done up, up to up to 1.3. And so we invited back the concept of a chain, right? Right here, we invited that concept back. So this is a perfect bridging between, or, or switching of gears between treating this as a continuum, don't tell me what's inside, to wanting to know what's inside. Because only then you can start to ask why you have the behavior. The question is why you have what you see. Not only how it occurs, Maxwell tells you that, but it doesn't tell you why it does that. 
Okay, so chapter two is about to tell you why, why this happened. And we're going to go very gently, very slowly, and build all the concepts step by step. But this 1.3 is already building one of the steps, which is the force, okay? which is the, the force per chain uh, involves this concept. It's a commonly known as elastic force, or often in the literature also known as anthropic force. But there is a limit, I just want to warn you. When the chain is very much straightened, uh, anthropic terms comes in too, which is, uh, which is actually beyond the scope of our 10 lectures to talk about it. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to, trying to recall whether that's fully beyond or not. Maybe I will have a chance to make some comment later. When we discuss the packing model. Okay, for now, uh, we, we are going to try to have a molecular version of what is Maxwell model. In other words, a molecular version of explaining where viscoelasticity comes from. Um, hi, Professor. Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. But I have a question about the, you say, many stretch and the uh, cross section, uh, the cross area become a uh, decrease and uh, the um, number density, I mean, strand density increase, right? Yes. And so if every cross section increase, then the, the total density increase. I mean, if the uh, volume uh, is a uh, You know where you're getting. A wonderful question. This is a question that has, let me re re repeat, give you some insight about it. This is a question that has been asked many times before, uh, which is this. He, uh, Zhe, Hao, Zhe Hao is trying to reconcile the following. That if what I did is right, am I changing the density of my system? Yeah, essentially. Of course, as I stretch my PDMS, I can just do that demonstration. Uh, my density, of course, doesn't change, yeah? So how do you think about, I just want to show you that I can also so-called break it. So how do I think about the density not changing, but I claim that you have, let me give you this word, which I later will, will uh, insist. I uh, will mention again. I call this effect geometric condensation. Okay? This concept. For those of you who are not going to be satisfied with my brief answer to Zhao's question, you can, for example, for Zhao's sake, you can go to chapter eight in the appendix. Uh, this uh, whole thing is answered. But let me uh, do a short uh, answer for you. That is this. Uh, well, uh, let me help you. Okay, let me help you with this. Joe uh, 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 Howe's uh, question is a. Uh, very natural one. Uh, many people would ask, Jesus, why you, if you do this dense condensation, don't you violate? Where does the chain go? It's, it's not going to satisfy the density. Well, this speaks about something very, uh, 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 very, uh, It, it, it really point out to the heart of polymer science. Actually, let, let me just dramatize it because I always do. Uh, let me dramatize it. Meaning, I, let me uh, 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 
uh, make it so that it's so, it looks so dramatic. This point, that's what it means. And it is very dramatic. Remember, we are eventually, I know we may run out of space, uh, time, but nevertheless, um, we eventually wish to at least touch a little bit on why polymer has the certain strength it does. Well, I demonstrated with the cup, I demonstrated with the plastic bags, I demonstrated with many things, right, containers. Well, you will be first disappointed to, disappointed to know the strength is not very good. Good, remember I use those words, it was good enough, <laughs> but not very good. And the reason they are not very good is partially to answer the house question, is because they typically stay like a coil. Okay? So when you stay like a coil, like your strand stays like a coil, your cross-link strand, you see what's deceiving to all of you? What's deceiving to all of you is this picture. I draw it as if it's not a coil, <laughs> but it's still a coil. You see, if it is a coil, uh, then if you imagine in some projection where it's, it's like this, then, each chain. So they occupy the, all the space in a wasteful way. It's all wasted. But human beings are very clever. I, I'm always amazed by this. We, for a long time, know how to make polymer fibers. OK? Now, think about this limit. Think about all the chains are straightened, like a chopstick. Then it really means now this is the limit. <laughs> Did I violate the, uh, the the density? No. I just have all the chains become chopsticks and line them up one by one. So the confusion about the density issue is our lack of appreciation of the deep meaning of this pic original picture. The density is very low because they are, co they are a coil. They wasted all your useful cross-sectional area. You're not using them. Does that make sense? You're touching the heart. We are speaking about the most profound issue in polymer science. As I said, before I figured out all this, people are already making fibers for ages. And that's the reason you go to science museum. They will show you they have a polymer fiber stronger than steel. Why? Because the covalent bonds are very strong if you can utilize each of them effectively. And you are not when they are in a coil form. And so I really, truly admire people who have done the fiber, so-called fiber spin, or come on, or cloth, cloth, no, polyester fibers. Man, how did they figure that out? I have no clue. Without, I, I bet at that time they don't have the science. Uh, the, the detailed signs of it. But somehow they figured out, somehow I want to utilize the fact that covalent bonds are very strong. The non-covalent bonds, the so-called Van der Waals bonds, are pathetically weak. Okay? And our weakness in polymers is because 
we cannot access the covalent bonds. We are accessing most of this uh, intermolecular bonds, interchain bonds. I might, I might make, I mean, it's, 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 uh, understandable what I'm discussing, yeah? The language I'm using. I, I don't need you to fully appreciate, but, but it is all coming from answering his question. Uh, uh, we're jumping the gun again, meaning we're, this is way a topic, uh, that eventually we wish to answer. But we're confronted right here already. And this is why one can never omit discussing extension. The shear was just a way to get us started. We can never avoid it because we want to have geometric computation. Period. So, yes, stop me any time uh, so we can uh, uh, make more, uh, more connections between, between what we are teaching to the eventuality of what we hope.